In this video, we're going to continue our journey through basic orchestral balancing. Previously, we talked about the different orchestral sections having different loudnesses while playing at the same dynamic. Now, we spice things up a little bit by not only using one library, which is already perfectly balanced, but two different libraries. We know that different sections are different volumes when playing at the same dynamic. Now in the same way, when we use different sample libraries, their own internal balance might be fine, but they won't automatically balance against each other. To make things clear, we have two different libraries. These two libraries might have been recorded with different microphones and also at a different distance from the player. Moreover, the two libraries will have different players playing their instruments differently. Therefore, by design, even if the libraries contain the same orchestral sections, these two different libraries will have different loudnesses between them, and the inner balances might differ from one to another. The total loudness of one library might differ to the total loudness of the other one. One may be louder, one quieter. Things become more clear when we dive back into our visual example for sonic perspective, the image of the house and the bike. But now we also have a second picture of another house and another bike taken with a different camera, and maybe from a different distance than the previous one. The bike in the second image is way bigger than the bike in the first. Now if we want to put the bike of the second image into our first one, we can't just drag it over. If we did that, it would almost be as big as the house. If the bike is too big to look realistic in the first image, then we need to rescale it. We need to make it smaller, so that it looks natural in the first image. It's very similar with orchestral libraries. If you have a section of a library that you like and you want to combine it with other libraries, then you need to rescale it. If one library is louder than another, then it might need turning down. Or maybe it has more dynamic range, and so you need to pay closer attention to your programming to get them to work together. Right, I've got a sequence here to demonstrate this, so let's play it. we can obviously hear that the brass is too loud. OK, let's break this down a little bit. I've got the Berlin Symphonic Strings here playing spiccato to open up the piece, and then I've got some more spiccato on the violins and the violas, and then long lines on the celli and the basses. And it's the same for the brass. At the start of the piece, the trombones and the cimbassi are playing staccato, and then the trumpets, the horns, trombones and tuba are all playing long sustains once we're into the middle of the piece. The strings is our bass, but we really like the extra intense sound of the Tom Hockenborg brass. Now, Tom even specified when making this library that he wanted the maximum volume of the brass to be frighteningly loud. Thus, it being super loud is completely intentional, but we can already imagine that the overall volume balance between this library and anything else won't be perfect straight out of the box. CC1 is the controller for dynamics. Now if we open up the brass parts here, we can see that CC1, modulation, is up at 127, at maximum. So if this was low down, then we'd be playing soft dynamics, and at the moment, up at maximum, 127, we're playing triple forte for the brass. Now we're trying to match that in our basses here, also pretty loud, sort of fortissimo, and in our cello, sort of going from mezzo forte up to fortissimo. And then we have the velocity data for our short strings, which works the same as modulation. The lower the velocity, the softer the dynamic. The higher the velocity, the louder the dynamic. And so around here, we're about maybe 100, 105, which is forte fortissimo. We can see that we've got our CC1 for the long notes on the brass in roughly the same place as the velocities and the other dynamic info for the strings. In context with the fortissimo samples in the strings, we're going to have an issue when we want our music to all be balanced at the same dynamic. How do you stop your ostinato strings being obliterated by the brass? So we could just turn the volume fader on the software instrument channels down, like this. But, speaking from experience here, if you're dealing with multiple libraries, maybe even from different developers, it can be cumbersome to have to address each track in the mixer like this. So there is another way, which basically works exactly the same, and that's to use CC7, the MIDI controller for main volume. 
Do not touch CC7. Yep, I said that, but I lied. Well, okay, not entirely. If you do have just one library, then you don't need to use CC7. But if you want a balance between different libraries, that's where the MIDI volume controller CC7 comes into play. And our main technical tool for this is your ears. Okay, we need to work this out then. And so I'm gonna pick one instrument as a basis, maybe the horns. The default CC7 value for zero dB is usually around 90. That's the kind of normal internal balance of the library. So we're already assuming that we're gonna put in a value lower than 90. I might try 80. If I solo the strings here and then solo the horns, I go to my MIDI volume region and I put in 80. And just to be tidy, I'm going to also rename my volume region to 80. And let's see what this sounds like. Still too loud. So maybe let's try 65. Okay, great. Now that we've worked out how much we want to reduce the CC7 value of the brass by, we can copy and paste that value to all the other tracks in the brass section. Okay, now let's play that. Now we can hear that the brass is balanced to the strings, just by putting in the proper CC7 values at the start of the tracks. You sometimes see this in people's big orchestral templates, where they have a little region of data at the start of every track, containing data like CC7, that pre-balances all of their libraries. You could, of course, also go the other way and turn the strings up, instead of turning the brass down. But personally, I think it's better to attenuate rather than to boost things, because then you're not going to run into an issue turning things down again later down the line. If you don't, and you go for the maximum loudness right from the start, then you might end up clipping in your final mix. Clipping is when too many loud signals are so loud that it creates a distortion in the mix. Now, let's talk about microphone positions. Sound is never naked. It's always recorded in some room, and we're not only hearing the sound of the instrument itself, but also the room with that. The sound carries information about where the instrument is. The same instrument sounds different when playing in a different room. This is the flute in the small studio. Compared to the same flute in a cathedral. It sounds different because we hear the room. Back to our metaphor of the house and the bike. Usually the house is bigger than the bike, but we also see the sky, we see the surroundings and the environment. The house and the bike might be standing in a city, or in the woods, or next to a cliff. It's always the same house and the same bike, but still the picture that we have and see looks different. And then there's more. There's the foreground and the background. To bring all of this home, we do the same thing when we record instruments in studios. Different orchestral libraries might be recorded in different locations. Some might be intended for small studios, some might be intended for larger studios, and some might be intended to be in a booth and everything in between. We can see that sonic perspective is a little more complicated than just matching the volumes of two patches. It's about finding a realistic way to paint the cohesive sound of a stage for our music. Recording an orchestra is a really intensive task. You have dozens of professional musicians in a recording room or at a recording stage, and they all perform and are recorded for days or even weeks. When we do this, we record the orchestra with different microphones from different distances. These different distances are what we call mic positions. 
Each mic position records a different sonic perspective. Now, usually orchestral libraries come with three standard positions. The most basic one is the close perspective. The microphones are pretty close to the instrument or the section. This perspective doesn't have as much room information included as we're already directly at the instrument. Then, usually we have another sonic perspective, the one of the conductor. We put some mics above where they're standing and this microphone formation is called a decca tree, or what we would normally refer to as the tree mics. Our third standard perspective is usually the room or the surround perspective. Here, we try to capture the whole room sound, like the reverb of a church or a recording stage. A bit like the example we just heard of the flute in the cathedral. These three mic positions are generally the standard ones, but your library might come with five, seven, or even more mic positions. These give you the possibility to control the sound as you would like. As you don't only need to select one mic position, you can mix between them. This is the mixer in Sign. Here you can choose the different mic positions. You can select mic positions individually or put them together in a mix. So for example here, we have a few extra mic positions than normal, but we have close mics in the spots here, our tree signal, and then we're going to use our surround signal for room mics. So we might choose to have, say, a lot of the surround signal, a little bit of the tree signal, and next to nothing of the close signal. Here's the catch, though. We're talking about two different libraries that we're trying to match. Each of the libraries might have been recorded in a different room, with different players, and also a different mic setup. And in the end, the close mics of one library will sound a little different to the close mics of another. And the tree and the room mics and so on will sound very different too. So when using two libraries, the sonic perspectives will never match perfectly. If we have one library recorded in one room and another library recorded in a different room, then we turn one of the libraries down, does the room now feel smaller? Of course, we don't really shrink the room or change the depth just by turning one up or the other down. So how do we actually match two different perspectives? By recording orchestral sample libraries in situ, which means as they're seated, you already get some of this depth included. The strings are closer to the mics than the woodwinds or the brass, but not every library is captured like that. Back to our previous example of the strings and the brass. In our case, the strings are by default a bit more roomy sounding than this particular brass library, which feels a bit more immediate and closer. To balance the two, you might find yourself wanting the brass to sound more traditionally orchestral. Now in this case, the brass is loaded in with the tree position, which sounds great, but it's also loaded in with the close position. And as we want to move the brass back into the sonic stage, I'm going to take the close position out. Okay, so we open up Sign, we head over to the Mixer tab, and then we can see here we have the close and the tree loaded, and so for every instance, all I've got to do is take the close mic out. In contrast, we want the strings to be a bit more prominent. So I'm going to turn the close mics of all the strings up. So I'm going to add the spot two mic position, and I'm also going to boost the spot one a little bit as well. I've just got to do this for every single string track. The key to adjusting different libraries with different sonic perspectives is to try and find a mic mix for each of the libraries that sounds similar. We could have something a bit more complicated. Maybe we want to add some strings and some choir from the Tallinn library here. Now, this library has been recorded in a church and it has a long reverb that's included in the samples. And that's not the only issue here. The strings in the choir are much quieter. So let's have a listen to the choir and the strings that I've added. Well that sounds nice, but it's not the sonic perspective that I want yet. It's not going to fit the rest of the project. So we have two challenges. Let's start with the loudness. If we just bump up the CC7 and therefore the loudness of the Tallinn strings and choir, then they do become louder, but you also change the nature of these sounds. They're intentionally quiet, and so you're just turning a quiet signal up. Now I know this is tedious, but the thing to do here is to turn everything else down again. So I'm going to reduce the CC7 value of every other track. And don't forget, your most important tool is this. Okay, now I've adjusted the CC7 values for everything else, 
Let's have a quick listen to the choir and see if it's any more audible. The volume balance is very good now, but the second issue is the very different room sound of the libraries. I want to lean in to the sonic perspective of the Tannin library here, inside the church, and I don't think the spot mics of this library are going to match the spot mics of the other two libraries. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to load in the surround microphones and take out the spot microphones, and this is going to push the strings and choir further back into the sonic stage. Now that we've done that, let's listen to the finished track. Look, it's often tedious to adjust all the different microphone mixes of all the different libraries to match. However, this is the right way to go, as you're really fixing the problem at its source. There's another solution that's very tempting, but it doesn't guarantee convincing results. You could send everything else into some reverb to add a bit more space, like the strings and the brass. If you put reverb on a close sound, you'll have a closely recorded sound with reverb. Take this example of our flute recorded in a small studio. If you put a cathedral reverb on it, it's not going to sound the same as if it were actually recorded in a cathedral. It will still sound as if the flute was close to the listener, just with an artificial church reverb around it. Now you're trying to mess around with these artificial reverb spaces and you're not dealing with the initial sound and room information recorded in the different mic positions. Whereas if you get a mix of the mic positions that sets the instrument where you need it in the sonic stage, then you won't need to add reverb to add depth in order to combine the different libraries. The issue here is now that you're trying to match reverb spaces and not dealing with the initial sound and depth of the instrument, and your reverb might become a tool to create a new space or create a different colour. However, to make it perfect, I think it still needs another trumpet melody. I can't play trumpet, but there are no rules, right? <laughs> 